So it's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Beverly Reynolds. Um, since May 2003, Beverly has been Chief of CSIRO Petroleum, and in, in July 2007, she was appointed Group Executive Energy, and we've just been talking to her, it's an amazingly large portfolio. Dr. Reynolds' career has spanned teaching, research, and the application of research to solve industry problems. She's the second Chief of CSIRO Petroleum since it was created in 1993. And she was former foundation director and also the Woodside Chair with the University of Western Australia's School of Oil and Gas Engineering. Her research interests include offshore structural stability and production facility selection. Dr. Reynolds has also had industry experience in design, installation and operations, support for fixed and floating offshore um, platforms, both in Australia's northwest shelf, the North Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico. In 2000, Dr. Ronalds was made a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and is also a Fellow of the Institute of Civil Engineers and the Institute of Engineers Australia. In 2003, she was awarded the Prime Minister's Centenary Medal for Services to Australian Society in Civil Engineering. She's included in Engineers Australia's inaugural list of the 100 most influential engineers in 2004. It is a particular pleasure to invite Beverly, especially because we really do want more women in science and engineering. So, welcome. It's uh, an absolute delight to be here this afternoon uh, to participate in this very important series of lectures uh, that have been put together by uh, the Whitlam Institute. Um, um, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, uh, a little bit of the what. Um, what are fossil fuels uh, in the Australian context, uh, also regionally and globally? And then why? Um, why uh, am I here talking about fossil fuels this evening? And uh, what is uh, uh, the problem and uh, what will they look like going forward and a bit on the how as well in terms of likely technologies, likely new technologies going forward and some of the key uh, factors influencing that path forward. Um, it's uh, probably close to the end of, of a big day for most of you so I thought I would start up front with um, what I think some of the key messages are. Uh, first of all, uh, the world runs on fossil energy. Ongoing fossil energy in the way uh, that we've been using it up till now uh, brings uh, two major challenges to the fore. Uh, first of all, greenhouse gas emissions and second, uh, tightening supply. And uh, there's a, a really interesting relationship between those two challenges and I think they're summed up beautifully by the opening sentence of the latest IEA World Energy Outlook which I've put there at the, at the bottom. The world is facing twin energy related threats. That of not having adequate and secure supplies of energy at affordable prices and that of environmental harm caused by consuming too much of it. It's a beautiful dichotomy that we're facing at the moment. And um, to solve it, we need an energy revolution. Uh, easy to say, a little bit harder to do. Um, I'm a technologist, I'm an optimist, and so uh, my natural view is that technology will find a way. Um, but I think when you think of the enormity of the problem, it, it is, um, it's not hard to become a, a little bit pessimistic, I think. Um, and another challenge we have, I think, with this energy revolution, uh, not only the scale, but the fact that I don't think we know yet what it is. There's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. We need a new energy future, uh, but what is it going to be? It's uncertain and dynamic. And uh, then I think the, the last point I would like to make is I think Australia can play a key role in this energy future. And we probably shouldn't say that too often because in the end of the day, Australia is only around 1% of global GDP. But certainly I see Australia as having particular challenges and also particular opportunities and I would argue responsibilities to play a strong role uh, in the region in terms of our energy future. Okay, so back to the beginning. Uh, the world runs on fossil energy and um, 
That's because historically it's been uh, relatively cheap and uh, readily available and as a result of that it uh, underpins our economy. Okay, so the other side of the story then is that fossil energy emits greenhouse gases. And uh, again, this is a plot here showing um, the, the growth of those emissions over um, the period since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, I don't um, pretend to understand climate science, but listening to climate scientists, um, I, I think we can't but agree that um, there's a global experiment going on at the moment uh, with some really scary potential consequences and any risk management strategy would say uh, we should stop this as soon as we possibly can. Uh, the, the risks are enormous. Okay, so coming down to Australia, um, in Australia we're particularly accustomed to cheap, readily available energy. Um, coal, uh, which underpins electricity generation, Oil that underpins our transport economy and is also used in many products. And gas for which we also have large reserves. So as a result, uh, fossil fuels supply a whopping 95% of Australia's energy needs, one of the largest proportions of any country. We do have other choices. We've got uh, uranium, we've got uh, the sun, we've got wind, we've got our oceans, we've got uh, geothermal potential. So there are a lot of opportunities, but they all do differ in terms of efficiency, emissions, reserves, and of course, cost. Okay, and when we're talking about our energy endowment, uh, I feel it's really important that we don't just focus domestically. Um, there's a really strong nexus uh, in energy between Australia and the region, and indeed we are one of the world's largest energy exporters. Back in um, the heyday of Bass Strait, we were sort of roughly speaking close to self-sufficient. Uh, that self-sufficiency is declining now, uh, both because um, Abair predicts that we will continue to want to use more oil, have increasing demand, uh, the lighter green line, and then also because our production is slowly declining. So uh, we can say that in all probability Australia has reached peak oil. It's not a nice smooth peak, it's more of a long bumpy plateau, but uh, there is not a very strong probability of us ever producing more than we produced in 2000 uh, when the peak happened. And um, as that um, self-sufficiency declines, uh, our trade gap will widen. And back in 2006, APIA predicted that that oil gap might be uh, worth $27 billion per year by 2015. And uh, the way the oil price is going, I'm sure that's likely to be conservative. So I want to explore this uh, peak a little bit more and particularly to give a couple of reasons why it's um, quite a, a long bumpy plateau rather than a sharp peak. And to do that, I thought I'd um, zoom in on the UK, which is um, a, a very important oil province, or it has been, uh, one of the, the world's largest oil and gas uh, producers in its heyday. And of course, um, many of us would know has ha oil production and gas production have had a, a dramatic influence on the UK economy over the last few decades. Uh, again, um, the production profile plotted here to the same scale. And uh, I think we can be pretty sure that uh, the UK has reached peak oil and uh, has reached peak gas. And uh, how does that peak made up? Well, the main diagram there gives an indication uh, by field. Uh, what happens is that we tend to find and produce the large, easy oil fields first. And then they start to decline, so we bring more fields on and then more fields. And it gets to the stage eventually, not that we've run out of oil, but um, it's only the hard stuff that's left. And um, that hard half can be accessed, but to access it needs uh, a range of other resources. First of all, it needs new technology, it needs uh, capital, and it needs people. And uh, they become uh, more scarce uh, um, as it becomes uh, a more declining province. Um, perhaps the, the only country that's not short of petroleum engineers is China that, at the moment, who is, um, China is now 
uh, graduating more than half of the world's petroleum engineers. But if you were um, a bright 20-year-old, would you want to join this sunset industry or would you go to another part of the world or join another industry? So I would argue that um, the decline that the UK is facing is not just around geology, it's around um, these other resources as well and indeed the decline might be even faster than that predicted by geology. All right, just to recap, um, first of all coal, um, our primary source globally for electricity, also uh, a pretty important player for our infrastructure in terms of steel and cement production. Um, highly abundant, uh, globally well distributed, but with the big downside of um, a significant greenhouse gas emissions. Oil underpins our transport sector, and we've just talked about some of the challenges around uh, the high oil prices and the limited geographic distribution. And then we've got gas. Um, sometimes I think a bit of the bridesmaid um, compared to oil and coal mm. to increase end use energy efficiency, uh, either in transport or in our buildings, to increase production efficiency or to displace uh, coal with gas, in carbon capture and storage, alternatives like nuclear and renewables, and um, also land use options like reforestation. And uh, these have been quantified. So for example, one wedge would be to build two million one megawatt wind um, stations, wind uh, turbine farms. Uh, not in addition to our coal, but by closing down the coal and building them instead. Another one would be to have 800 carbon capture and storage, um, uh, 800 gigawatt coal-fired power plants are fitted with carbon capture and storage. Or another one would be to double the fuel efficiency of two billion cars, um, up to 60 miles per gallon. So there they are, they're quantified, but uh, I think we'd agree they're, they're fairly big challenges. And what will um, fossil fuels do and be in this new regime? Well, I'm just going to touch very, very quickly on a few of the low emissions technologies, carbon capture and storage, natural gas and fossil fuels to liquids and some of the Australia-specific challenges and opportunities in those areas. First of all, um, carbon capture and storage. Um, I, I will just dance across this because I believe my colleague will go into it in more detail. Just to, to say that there are various options. They're all being pursued in Australia. Um, the, di the picture here is um, of a pilot plant for post-combustion capture. And indeed, the first post-combustion capture pilot plant uh, was launched uh, just this April down in Victoria, which is capturing emissions from an existing power station. Of course, so it's one thing to capture them. You then have to do something with them, and that's um, where CO2 sequestration comes in because of the scale of the emissions. Uh, a, a very good solution is to pop them underground. And the big challenge here is we're just starting the pilots to move up from that to upscale, reduce costs, reduce risks into demonstration and commercialization. This is the other half of the bargain, the storage. And again, the, the first geo-sequestration pilot in Australia started again in April in Victoria. Uh, some real challenges with this as well. I think sometimes people think uh, maybe it's just as easy as drilling a hole next to the car park at the power station and popping the CO2 down. It's not quite that easy. Um, there's only some parts that um, are, are suitable geology for um, the scale of emission uh, injection we're talking about, the periods of time we'll be wanting to safely inject over, and of course most important of, tall, uh, of all is um, the, the requirement for um, surety of long-term containment. Uh, this is not going to work unless the CO2 stays down there for thousands of years, otherwise it's not a solution. So to sum up, um, this is, again, um, some CSIRO modelling of um, one scenario of how we might be able to reduce emissions to 50% below 1990 levels by 2050. 
Uh, it's only one scenario. Uh, it's, if you like, a, a version of the Australian wedges diagram. We see here um, fossil fuels make the biggest cut. That's um, cleaning up fossil fuels. But uh, it's, again, not a, a single magic bullet. It's a whole range of things need to be brought to bear, um, from alternative fuels and vehicles, reduced travel, uh, nuclear, renewables, distributed generation, uh, like, uh, again, the gas turbines, etc., cetera, and um, last but certainly not least, energy efficiency. And then just um, my last slide, uh, what can we do to make this happen? Uh, what do we do to grasp the nettle? And I think we really need to focus on our opportunities and the opportunities that will deliver the most impact. Uh, we should focus, I think, initially on our particular Australian challenges and opportunities, and uh, I hope I've outlined a few of those. We have a number of specific um, opportunities around our resource endowment. And I would argue as well that we all have responsibilities in this area as well, because uh, it's only by uh, us as consumers and R&D providers and industry and governments working together, uh, pulling in the same direction that we're ever going to make this happen. Um, Caroline Alk, also from the Department of Education and Training. Um, I just was wondering about that scenario, the CSIRO scenario that you put up at the end, because are you arguing that that is actually a feasible scenario or are you just putting it up for the... I mean, what are the assumptions behind that? Because I would have thought a lot of people might question how realistic it is to assume that carbon capture and storage technology is going to work, is going to have that massive effect, is going to be able to be rolled out, etc., etc. But are you actually making a claim that you think it is all feasible, it's all quite doable and it's just a matter of political will? Um, now, researchers never make claims like that because we're always after more research dollars. <laughs> um, one of the, the great beauties of scenarios is that you're not claiming anything. You put in a set of assumptions and you look to see what comes out of it. And uh, this particular modelling had a, a whole range of different scenarios that came out with different things. Um, these numbers come out of techno-economic modelling with certain constraints in there. So it's saying, with the set of assumptions behind this scenario, this is what the mix turned out to be. Um, there, there's no claim that this is the right mix. And indeed, um, we need to do, I would argue, we need to sort out priorities and then keep developing technology in all the plausible scenarios right up until we know that they're cost effective and feasible or they're not. It's a point I tried to make at the beginning is the future is very uncertain. It's not like it's all laid out and we just go and do it now. We now move on to um, our second speaker, Dr. Alan Lowe, who worked at the Electricity Commission of New South Wales, subsequently Pacific Power, from 1968 to 2003, where he held senior positions in power plant design technology, develop, technology development and boiler and environmental control plant performance. Um, for a range of different groups. He completed a PhD on radiation heat transfer at the University of Newcastle and subsequently became involved in a number of UNDP overseas training programs, lecturing in developing countries in Asia on coal utilization and pollution control with a view to assisting these countries improve their coal utilization technologies and practices. Dr. Lowe was part of the team that made a successful application to form the Cooperative Research Center for black coal utilization and served as program manager technology assessment with the CRC from its inception. Since leading Pacific Power in 2000, he has provided advice to the power industry on coal technology, coal technology and plant performance issues and completed the study of geosequestration, looking at the options for New South Wales. Dr. Lowe presently holds positions of adjunct associate professor with the engineering faculty at Sydney University, lecturing on energy and its impact on the environment, and he's also the chief technologist with the Cooperative Research Centre for Coal and Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Clearly from my background you'll see that I'm a, a fossil fuel person, and uh, I'm going to uh, perhaps talk about one of the wedges, one of uh, the... Uh, the Sokolo wedges, which will allow us to reduce our carbon emissions into the future. Before I do that, I want to put this into a bit of perspective. 
I know we're talking about Australia's energy security, but I think we need to step back a little. I'm going to, I hope, answer some of the questions that have just come out. So let's see how we go here, so we can get this thing to work. Firstly, just a few thoughts on energy security, and this is, I guess, a big picture view. It's not energy security for Australia or for me or you, it's the world in uh, general. Firstly, there's an interesting little law called White's Law, which states that culture equals energy times technology. White was an uh, anthropologist, and he studied a lot of uh, uh, societies over uh, many hundreds of years. Sorry, societies going back over hundreds of years. He didn't do it that over hundreds of years himself, of course. <laughs> um, and he came to this little rule. If you want to reduce your energy use but maintain the level of culture, which is your level of uh, advancement, then you have to increase the level of technology. Conversely, if you reduce your energy, maintain the same level of technology, the level of culture that you have decreases. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule behind that particular law, but uh, if you look at uh, what happens around the world today, you find an excellent correlation between energy use and uh, quality of life, such as the indicated by the Human Development Indicator provided by UNDP. So we need energy, no doubt about it. If we want security, we have to have equity, equity of energy. And this is perhaps something that people overlook. Presently around the world, there's about two and a half billion people who rely for their energy on wood and cow dung. And that's simply not equitable. Um, that has to be addressed. Society is becoming globalized. We can't look at security on behalf of ourselves alone. It's a, an, it's a global issue, has to be solved by global issues. And finally, we tend to think over short terms, really. We need to think in terms of plus 50, plus 100 year time frames. And that's what the uh, IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, is looking at. They're looking at those sort of time frames. Currently, we use about 11 uh, billion tonnes of oil equivalent, and we're producing about seven gigatons of carbon. I've written it as CO2, but it's actually gigatons of carbon. That's just a lot of carbon. Just remember the seven. We'll come back to that. 80% roughly of the world's energy comes from coal, oil and gas. And there's about 0.5% from what Dr. Ronald's called the new renewables, solar, wind, heat and geothermal. It's a trivial amount. This slide was, uh, this work was done um, leading up to the, uh, one of the first IPC, International Panel on Climate Change reports on uh, uh, global CO2 emissions. It looked at whether we would run out of, basically run out of air or run out of carbon. The question is, do we have a problem with emissions or do we have a problem with supplies? It tries to work out the cost of supply of carbon, gigatons of carbon across the bottom, and it takes the it recognises all those reserves I talked about and it looks at what would happen for somebody or what would, would appear for somebody at 2100 looking back to see what we've got in the way of fossil fuels and how much it cost us to get them. In other words, it's allowing an improvement in uh, technology over time. <coughs> um, the improvement is 1% per year, not a lot, but it actually allows for that. The numbers... You could argue about the numbers here, I have to say, but the order of magnitude you can't. We've got 5,000 gigatons of carbon locked up as fossil fuels that we expect to get for something like $40 a tonne. It won't necessarily be very convenient fuel. It might be anthracite, which is pretty hard to use, um, or it might be coal tar, which is uh, equally as unpleasant, or high sulphur, but it's there, it can be got. This looks at some carbon emission trajectories projected by the IPCC, and they're looking at how we might conceivably get to uh, 50, 550 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's a little bit higher than we currently are now, but it's seen to be a number that may be sustainable. It shows a band of different scenarios of how we can get to there. The scenarios, again, I'm afraid. Time going out across the bottom axis, and gigatons of carbon emission going up the top. We're currently around there. There's a gigatons of carbon equivalent, which is 
sorry, I won't go into that. It's a little bit more than the uh, emission from coal, uh, from fossil fuels. If we don't do anything, we go up trajectory like that. If we take some actions, we're going to have to turn it around. If we're out here at 2,100, if I can see correctly, we have to be about half of what we're currently doing if we want to get down and maintain that 550 ppm in the longer term out here, which is where our gun kids come into it. Why carbon capture and storage? There's a good reason. Firstly, it builds on 100 years of uh, technology innovation. We continue to use our existing investment in infrastructure, schools and capability, manufacturing capability. We don't have to restructure society right now. We can do it a little later. It buys time for development of more cost-effective renewable technologies, and it's applicable on a large scale. It's, uh, uh, it's got a lot of things going for it. it uh, security of storage. People are very worried about uh, injecting sand into the ground, and perhaps rightly so. It's denser than air, and if it leaks up, it can be, it'll, it's toxic in concentrations about above 15%. However, CO2 is it's down there now, as we speak. Uh, it's a common gas in coal and oil <laughs> reservoirs. There's a lot of coal below Sydney. It will contain CO2. It's been there for a long time. Large deposits of CO2 occur in nature. Uh, they've been there for millions of years and they'll continue to be there. Also, CO2 is reactive, and if the rocks it's injected to are similarly reactive, then the CO2 will be fixed. And that's probably something that we can look for when we're looking for uh, places to put it. Over a thousand years or so, we've probably locked up most of the CO2. And uh, that's my last slide, so uh, uh, thank you very much. And our last speaker is Ian Dunlop, who was formerly a senior oil, gas and coal industry executive. He chaired the Australian Coal Association in 1987-88, the AGO Experts Group on Emission Trading in 1999-2000, and was CEO of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, 1997-2001. Ian Dunlop has wide experience in energy resources, infrastructure, and international business. He worked for the Royal Dutch Shell Group for over 30 years, initially in oil and gas exploration and production in various parts of the world, including Nigeria, Kurdistan, the UK, Netherlands, and the North Sea. Subsequently, he became involved in long-term energy planning and diversification into other energy resources, including coal and renewables. During the 1980s, Ian ran Australia's coal mining ventures, producing and exporting to customers worldwide. He has recently made a submission to the Prime Ministerial Task Force on Emissions Trading, entitled Climate Change and Peak Oil, an Integrated Policy Response from Australia. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do is to um, build on the comments that um, Beverly and Alan have given you um, in taking a, a fairly broad global view of the integration of um, fossil fuels, global warming, and uh, indeed the whole question of sustainability, because in the end, to me, this is really all about uh, global sustainability. Um, the <coughs> fossil fuel and global warming components are certainly critical, um, but it is a much bigger set of issues than I think uh, we are tending to think, it, think in terms of. So if I could just take a very broad view to begin with, um, if you go back a decade in 1998, um, the world was driven by a whole series of key drivers that people thought were really very positive things. So you had population growth, um, you had the market economy, you had the fact that uh, people were coming out of poverty around the world, uh, inequality in theory was reducing, and globalization and technological change were absolutely critical to um, our prosperity, and they have been since the end of, uh, well, certainly the Second World War and long before that. But over the last decade, virtually all of those drivers have actually become what uh, I would argue are strategic risks. What's a strategic risk? Well, if you're in a company as a risk manager, you worry about operational risks. Strategic risks are those big risks outside the organization or outside the country even, which have the ability to completely disrupt or even destroy uh, conventional wisdom and the way we work. If you look at population, uh, we, we're six and a half billion, we're growing to nine by 2050. Uh, everybody aspires to a higher quality of life, quite understandably. 
If you look at the market economy, it's been incredibly beneficial in one sense in terms of material wealth and, and power for some people, but not for all. It's made humanity a planetary force which now has the capability of destroying the planet if we actually uh, continue under the current rules. On the poverty and inequality front, 15% of the world enjoy 80% of, uh, of the population enjoy 80% of world GDP. The immediate problems are we have a convergence of uh, peak oil, and I'm uh, an unreserved peak oiler from way back, I have to say, uh, climate change, water and food, all of which are coming together and creating, uh, in my view, an unsustainable world. We used to have a world that was relatively empty. Now we have a world that is relatively full. And we don't actually have the flexibility any longer to keep doing what we have been, become accustomed to do. But it's not just these four. Um, you also have a whole range of other peaks following fairly close on. You're already seeing food prices going up. You have problems with wild fish stocks. You've got uh, a water problem, arable land. Um, we gaily talk about moving to nuclear, but that's not necessarily that simple. Um, the same with gas, coal, some metal, zinc, for example, is becoming in short supply. And so you go on, because the consumption levels of that 6.5 billion people are continuing to go up, and you really cannot sustain that. But of the, um, all of those, the critical issue really is energy. And that's because we've become accustomed to an economy based on cheap energy, based on cheap fossil fuels, as my colleagues have said. Uh, this just shows on the horizontal axis the GDP per capita versus primary energy per capita. And as you can see, as you move along on the, on the bottom axis to the uh, right, the amount of energy you use as you become wealthier goes up, which I think uh, Alan's already referred to and Beverly has. So I'd like just to touch on climate and peak oil um, as a, a scene setting for the, the whole question of sustainability. Um, climate change is really the ultimate tragedy of the commons, and Garrett Hardin, I think, invented the term way back in the 50s, but it was actually Aristotle who started it even a long time before that. And what it really means is that we become extremely good at the individual, the local, the national level at setting the right standards, for example, for environmental terms. We, we don't let raw sewage flow down the street. We insist that mines have reasonable standards of uh, environmental performance and so on. Uh, that's all happened very well nationally, but what we don't do is the same thing globally. We've assumed the atmosphere is there for everybody to use. It doesn't cost anything. So we stick carbon in it, and the scientific evidence is increasingly that is really causing us now a major risk, a very major risk. I'll, in the interest of time, uh, the peaking of oil is basically because of the way oil is produced from a, a reservoir. You sort of increase production initially, you reach a peak, and, and then as you fully delineated the field, and then the oil um, flow drops off because of depletion in the pressure in the reservoir. The picture that the organization I'm uh, involved with, ASPO, uh, that Beverly mentioned, has of global supply is this one, uh, which basically shows that oil is the green. You've got um, uh, heavy oil in here. You've got deep water oil in blue. You have polar, natural gas liquids. And then above that, you have gas and non-condensate gas. Now, gas doesn't uh, itself peak until a bit later out here. This is a cumulative graph that the oil peak is somewhere around now. It may have been passed, it may, we may have passed it already, it could be that um, we are actually uh, some years away from it. It's, it doesn't really matter terribly much exactly what year. The, the key issue is the principle, because to solve this takes a lot of time, and you really have to start thinking about uh, putting solutions in place way ahead of hitting the peak. We haven't done it, and that's why we're starting to see oil prices go up. Um, oil prices, um, because of this peak approaching, are going up. Uh, and what you can see is the, um, the oil price jump in recent times, in real terms, is considerably greater than we had in the first oil shock here. And the problem, reason this is occurring is that converting the resources, we have plenty of resources in the ground in theory, but converting them to flows into the market is proving difficult. We're not discovering enough new oil fields, and no giant ones. They all happened in the 50s and the 60s. The data on existing oil reserves is suspect, particularly in the Middle East. 
Um, many established provinces are declining often more quickly than people have been prepared to admit. The unconventional sources are proving difficult. They're more expensive. They're in very deep water, as uh, Beverly indicated. The technology is incredibly good, but it's also incredibly expensive. And therefore, the cost is going up. So um, the oil producing countries themselves are also using more of it because their populations are extremely young. Uh, they all have very high demands, and you're going to see more of it. Kuwait, for example, is not prepared to now export more oil because they want more for their grandchildren. And the King of Saudi Arabia made the same comment two nights ago, actually. He has a, a conference in Jeddah, I think, on Monday, where we'll see whether they can actually increase production. Um, the global response to all of this, um, we can either have continued denial, which is what we've been in for the last 10 years, and the market and technology will fix it. The wealthy will win, maybe, but only in the short term. You can have a grudging acceptance of the problem, which says, well, what we have, we hold, and we reinforce natural sovereignty. We have bilateral resource deals, resource nationalism, and if need be, military intervention, which was basically what happened in Iraq. On the other hand, you can have an unreserved acceptance that we now have a problem that is much bigger than any nation state uh, it needs some form of global governance to manage it. It means we have to cede sovereignty um, in the interests of global stability. And we have to have an equitable sharing of the burden. Um, the Kyoto Protocol was a start in carbon emissions, though it went nowhere near far enough. Uh, the oil depletion protocol that uh, uh, a <coughs> gentleman mentioned is part of it. I believe we're going to get up to the point where we have to have global per capita carbon allocations and probably global per capita oil allocations. Anathema to conventional economists, but um, I suspect that's the way the world is going. So I would argue that what we're facing is a genuine global emergency. We really do have very little time to move this thing along. We've left it too late. Uh, all sorts of things are now converging. And uh, if you'd said this, I think, six months ago, you were generally shown the door and reviewed as a bit of, viewed as a bit of a rat bag extremist. But increasingly, senior people around the world are um, making the same comments, and i can give you a few of them there. So what does it need? It really needs emergency action. Um, it needs something like the equivalent of the Marshall Plan post-World War II, the Apollo Project, the Manhattan Project, um, the way the economies were turned around uh, pre-World War II itself. You have to redefine success based on long-term sustainability, not short-term uh, uh, <coughs> or maximizing consumption. Markets, you really have to redefine based on the, the concept of the global commons and not on short-term profit maximization. It's going to need very different forms of community involvement because the community have to really be into this. Um, I question whether our existing democratic structure can handle it. If you look at what's happened in Canberra in the last three weeks, um, it's pretty clear. Um, but we really have, we have to move uh, into looking at different forms uh, of management. It means the different uh, opportunities for developed and developing world cooperation in terms of getting on top of this problem. Um, we need new technology, there's no question but it has to be combined with changing values. Um, we need a new paradigm. The first step is an honest articulation of the problem, which we've not been getting. We're still not getting it. We certainly didn't have it from the Howard government. We're still not getting it from the, uh, the Rudd government, the new government. Um, we have to, uh, before you can put out the solutions, you really have to acknowledge the size of the problem. Uh, this is not about primarily economics. It's risk management. And any corporate risk manager will look at this thing and say, hey, guys, we really have a problem. We have to take a different approach. Sure, the economics can help, but it's not the primary driver. Um, the primary driver is to stop the extreme risk exposure. So we need genuine leadership of a different sort. Um, and I think I've gone through most of the points there already, so I won't repeat them. It's going to require maximum cooperation, I think, between uh, community, government, and business. And it really does mean we have to dispense with politics as usual. You're not going to solve this with the sort of approaches I think we've seen uh, historically in a problem of this size. This is different. This is not a normal part of the, the political agenda. And we're tending to assume it is. 
My name is Annie Nielsen and I'm from the Parramatta Climate Action Network and we have been speaking to the, some of the local MPs and we have told them, what, like you have said, that this is really an emergency situation. We can't just go on as business as usual. And they've basically looked at us and said, well, you know, <laughs> nothing's going to change. Is that we're a, a war or an emergency situation? It's just not going to happen. And then I read in the paper yesterday that Ian MacDonald came out and said that New South Wales can't... Um, have, we have to really think carefully about um, carbon trading because it's going to, our businesses are going to be disadvantaged compared to other countries and we can't do that. It seems to me the New South Wales government isn't really listening. What can we and you and everybody else do to, to change things? Yeah. Well, I, I, think, um, I think you should take heart from what's happened in the last two years. Um, if you were at the beginning of 2007, you would probably not have thought we had a new government by the end of the year. Um, if you look around the world at what's happening in uh, attitudes toward this, you are now suddenly finding all sorts of groups coming out, um, particularly uh, authoritative groups like the IEA, who have been in complete denial about this um, until literally uh, probably now about a year ago. Um, they suddenly started putting the flag up and saying, hang on, we seem to have a bit of a problem. Their 2007 Energy Outlook, which came out last November, um, if you go and look at the website, you'll find the chief economist is saying, listen, if we don't do something in six years, the wheels may fall off this energy system. Uh, two weeks ago, he even made, uh, some, made some even more um, blunt statements. So groups like that, which is the watchdog for energy for the developed world, are suddenly saying, look, this is quite different. And they're not just talking about oil, they're talking about the whole climate issue, which is, what, I think, one of the slides I put up. So the official view, if I can call it the official future, is suddenly changing. Um, governments uh, are being advised by the IAEA. They're being told very bluntly that they have to change policies quickly. Um, you're finding the um, head of the UN is coming out with the same stuff. The heads of a number of um, major oil companies have been making the same point. Um, very few people are prepared to utter the words peak oil, but nonetheless they're talking about the same thing in slightly different formats. Um, so I think a lot is happening. And uh, the climate, on the climate front, um, I think we're going to see really dramatic change in the course of the next 12 months. The point about it, though, is that it needs community action. It is absolutely critical that the community is putting the pressure on governments at all levels because it's not something the politicians are going to lead on. This is much too big. It is too hard for them to handle. The system is structured, is structured in such a way that it's almost impossible for them. And it needs uh, really maximum pressure, which is, in fact, I would argue, what the Australian community uh, demonstrated last November at the election that we were not happy with what had been said. We weren't being given the truth. Um, now, the new government has a mandate, in my view, to take serious action. The issue is going to be, will it use that mandate or will it fudge the issue? Now, the Garner report is the crucial litmus test, in a sense. Um, Ross Garner, who's doing it, uh, has made some very blunt statements about this problem, and he's, I suppose, on a similar wavelength to myself in terms of the size of it. Um, I hope he'll come out with a very blunt report, which will be really quite sweeping change. I mean, this is not going to, this is going to, this is going to hit everybody, but we have to recognize that that's what we actually need. And um, the question will then be, well, is the government actually going to pick this up and do something, or is it going to fudge it and, and you know, we're back in the, the same old arguments again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.